this week's program. We're going to be talking about farm accounting. We're also going to look at landscape architecture and talk about daffodils and tulips, not necessarily from Amsterdam. But in just a moment, we find out who and what rural women New Zealand is all about. Margaret, we know that you guys exist and you're doing very wonderful jobs, but let's go right back to the beginning. Who and what are you as an organisation? Right, well, we're out there for rural women and their rural communities. I mean, we have been around for 90 years. Um, the vision of our early ancestors was to support rural women, the more isolated rural women, and that hasn't changed over the years. Although the wording and what we, what we, how we express that has and how we do it. Because so. you, you were known as Women's Division Vision. Federated Farmers, which yes. it was politically incorrect in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, yes, we were never part of Federated Farmers. When it, when it first started, it was uh, farmers' wives who went to the um, Farmers' Union Conference in Wellington in 1925. And they, they, they um, discussed it there and, and set up the organisation because they realised there was a lot of isolated rural women who weren't getting access to services and they were just very lonely and mm. they wanted to go out and, and support them. And, and that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, and exactly. Um, you know, <clears throat> there was a newspaper I was reading last week about the, how isolated rural wo women are feeling these days and how you know, the connections aren't there and what do they do? And it's Especially at the moment, Margaret, if, if I can be so bold, because the pressure is really on partnerships running farms. Absolutely. Yes, the downturn has done it, and um, you know, who do, they don't know who to turn to. I mean, our method of communication has changed completely. You know, there's a lot, you know, they have social media now, but the, it's the face-to-face -face communication that is so important. The, 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 the connections, the connecting and, and talking to people. And I think that, and that's one of the pillars of rural women New Zealand right through the years. Is that so? The social network, as it was called then, today's mm. jargon, it is called connections and connecting with people, and um, it, that is extremely important. Whether it just be for that support, that you know they're in the same situation or or or, or whatever, mentoring, it is just so important. You've come a huge way from being labelled as scone producers. Absolutely. Exactly. And I'm sorry to bring that up. But. Yes, no, we don't talk about that now. Well, no, we're still very good at it. Mind you, we're all still very good at it. But yeah, there are four pillars to rural women. You know, we have our, our vision is to be dynamic rural communities or mm. resilient rural communities. If you're resilient, you're going to be dynamic. But um, there's four pillars, pillars and we have the social one, which is the connections and everything, and that's very important. And we have lots of ways of doing that. Um, at the moment, we're collaborating with Farming Mums New Zealand to work with them to bring them in. And we have one down in South Canterbury, a, a get together next week, which we're working together on. And you know, that, that, that is to bring another dynamic, another younger group into the, just to get them mixing and connecting. But we're very good at that. Um, we have education as another pillar that we have, and we have lots of skills days. We're always learning new skills. We have education grants. We have our Women in Farming group, which is uh, very much for women who are actively farming. Mm. And, they and can there's come more and together. more of those. Absolutely. And they come together and they share ideas and learn new skills. Um, you know, that's where their interest is. Uh, so we've got the social education, we have our charitable side, which is again a very important one. So, And we support, as you know, we did leptospirosis support mm, mm. years ago and we do it again, did it again a few, years, a few years ago. And again, it's still in the media, it's still an issue and we still have to keep an eye on that. But you know, other things we've done, breast cancer research, we've pro prostate cancer and um, mental health. And this year we're looking at life education as a national project for all rural women and supporting the Life Education Trust because that's something that we were involved in right from the very beginning. When it first came to New Zealand, rural women were there on the ground floor getting it out. So, so Margaret, how do people join? And there's going to be some who will say, I wouldn't mind joining, but I don't need a job. Right. You don't have to have a job. We, we've got it. I, I always liken it to if a woman, if someone is looking for the complete organ, and they want, only want to join one organisation, rural woman is there because you've got so many different 
ways you can be involved. You, you can just do it on the internet if you want to. You can come along to a coffee morning. You can get involved in the advocacy. You can, it's got leadership training. You can take, take it through the leadership training. And um, there's lots of, lots of ways you can be involved. You can, as I said, you can just be an individual member and not go to meetings, but still get, get yourself involved. And those who are there, who do drive up driveways and, and have a cup of coffee with with the member because they don't know who to turn to, they're about. You Absolutely. Can... Yes, yes, we have got members who are still doing that and our, and our members are very involved in the Rural Support Trust trusts around the country at the moment and that's certainly something they're, they're, they're doing and keeping an eye out for the neighbours. Um, you know, we used to be, I always likened it to the glue in the rural communities, holding rural communities together. We'd organise the community get-togethers and the, and the things in the local hall but perhaps we're not doing that quite so much but we're still there to, to support and perhaps it'll be more in collaboration or partnership with other other organisations like Rural Mums, Rural Farming mm. Mums New Zealand and um, different ones like that that will work together. So, and so, very yeah. briefly, are women more inclined to ask for help? than men, because men are pretty well known for not. Yes, yeah, I think they are, um, yeah, but uh, but I think also they they look at it, and, and this is why we have, we are sort of working with Farming Mums New Zealand. Young mums were more likely to go to, to that group mm. rather than to us, they, they perceive us as, you know. <laughs> Don't say oldies because you're no, not. No, I'm not, <laughs> absolutely not. But 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 again, I I've heard again recently. You know, they they want to learn new skills and mentoring. They we have been through a downturn, a couple of downturns before. Mm. Maybe we did learn one or two things back then. And, and you we know can how to get through. We know how to get through. We can share it with them, not tell them how to do it. But share it. Share with them. it. Margaret, share thank you very much, and all power to your elbow, as they say. In just a moment, we'll be talking landscape architecture. So, Don, what is solar? Solar is the school of landscape architecture. Um, we're here within Lincoln University. Uh, we're also within the Faculty of Environment, Society, and Design. Um, and within our program, we've got the Bachelor of Landscape Architecture, and we've also got the Master of Landscape Architecture as well. And landscape architecture is more than just cottage, pretty cottage gardens, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Landscape architecture is not just a garden. Uh, that's obviously something that is part of our sort of foray of things. Um, but that's very much the start of the spectrum. Um, when we're thinking about landscape architecture, we sort of go right from the small scale, through from seat design, furniture design, through to courtyard design, gardens, um, right through to things like subdivisions, through to master planning as well. So for instance, um, Pegasus was designed by landscape architects. So it's a whole new community in itself. So we can go right from the very small scale to the large scale. Uh, landscape architecture also sort of thinks about things in a holistic sense. So we have a more sort of um, overall arching kind of concept of things. So we, we think about right through from the small scale to the large scale and everything that we do as well. And conservation? Yeah, so um, conservation is obviously a big part of what's happening here in New Zealand. Um, we've had students here also sort of thinking about conservation a lot in some of their projects. Uh, for instance, the year before last, uh, we had some third year students working on a project for a potential new national park in Mackenzie country, the grasslands. Um, and basically one of the things we were taking them through there uh, was to challenging the concept of what a national park is in the 21st century. You know, is it just a place that you go to visit? Is it a place that you actually are totally immersed in a different type of experience? Is it something that's just in one location? Is it spread out? And how do they actually interact with it? Is there a digital aspect to it now? Yeah, so we got them asking through some of those big questions as well. And conservation agriculture? Yeah, so this is a, a new concept which is starting to sweep the world. Uh, this is basically looking at farming in a more sustainable way. So looking at actually working with the land, working with what you've actually got currently there on the farm. Um, so for instance, um, up in it was Oronga Station in Young Nick's Head, um, a, uh, an American firm has brought in this concept and they've actually worked with the lands of this Thomas uh, Nelson, Bird's, Nelson Bird Waltz firm. Um, they've got 6,000 hectares currently set around the world in conservation agriculture and they've, they've worked with a client up in the North Island and working with the land, the cultural processes as well because it's got a lot of Māori history as well there. Um, and they've also created it as a financially viable farm. So it's more than just here's some pretty green that we're going to kind of protect and just leave it off to the side, but actually working with 
the landscape, working with the natural vegetation in a financially viable way. So they've also been looking at, for instance, their branding and identity. So it's a beef and lamb farm. Um, so it's actually got now a very big international reputation simply because of how viable it is to actually mix conservation and agriculture at the same time. And your fourth years are actually working on projects of their own as well? Yeah, at the moment they're um, working on um, building up a design study. So that goes through the, the groundwork for their second semester work. Um, and they're also working on uh, three different sites currently um, for looking at catalytic change. So the three sites that they're looking at, um, one is a, a cricket club in Auckland, another one is an urban uh, living residential development in central city Christchurch, and also a, um, a green site in Shanghai in the Huangpu River. And the, the purpose or the brief for that particular project is that they have to look at a site and they've got to think of it as something that would create a catalytic change. So people would look to the site and use it as, say, like an exemplar or something that would inspire change throughout people's attitudes or even just bigger the scale design as well throughout the world. So it's a big task for them in that sort of project. Yeah, and then the second half of the year, that's when they work on their major design. So as fourth year students, just before sort of heading towards the, the last stretch, they work on a site of their choosing um, and they work on that from a regional scale, which is sort of around 1 to 10, 1 to 20,000, right down to 1 to 100 and building construction details at 1 to 10, 1 to 20. And the practical application of those projects? Yeah, so the fourth year is when they finish. Uh, they go on to go onto some amazing sites and places around the world. So we have students who not only work here in New Zealand, but also, say, for instance, go to Australia, uh, Dubai, England, America as well. Um, and they can go on to work on some quite impressive projects too. Um, for instance, the, uh, the lead designer for the blueprint plan here in Christchurch was a landscape architect. Um, so he was in charge of coordinating some of those things. And as a landscape architect, we have this overall kind of thinking, like I was saying before, this holistic thinking. Uh, we can team a whole lot of people together and actually come up with a really good result. What's the main thing you'd actually like people to take away about landscape architecture? I think probably the main thing would be that it's more than just pansies and petunias at, say, for instance, at your garden gate or something, you know, if, I mean, if I had a dollar every time someone said to me, oh, you're a landscape architect, oh, you can come and do our garden. Um, it's, it's not landscaping, for instance. Uh, landscape architecture obviously looks at the design of things and the arrangement of our landscape, how we can blend our natural processes and actually harmoniously balance them with our cultural processes as well. And that was Kim Johnson asking the questions. I've often wondered though why everybody has to use all those Latin names and a willow tree is something unpronounceable or whatever it is that we call whatever it becomes unpronounceable at all because that Latin. And straight away after the break we're going to be talking about farm accounting and some new rules about paying your tax. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy, 
She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Kerry, software and GST. Yeah, for a while now, IRD have been trialling with several businesses the ability to actually file your GST return online via software. So straight out of your accounting software. Um, in the past, you've had to you know, print out your GST report, log into their system, then fill out the uh, online return or a paper one, if you're still mm -hmm. doing it the old-fashioned way, and then <laughs> send it into IRD. There's probably quite a few who do it the old-fashioned <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, there is, <laughs> but they're going to be forced off that soon. Um, so now, that from this month in April, you can actually start sending your GST directly out of your accounting software to IRD. So you don't have to make, you won't make those mistakes of, you know, transposing figures or missing out a box or anything like that. The and software's going to do it for you. And they can read it. Yeah, they can read it as well, which is a big thing, um, because they do get rejected, quite a few of them. Uh, it's only for certain software, though. So um, we know one big provider's already got theirs certified and are doing it, and some others are coming on board. So if it's something that you want to do and you're running software, then it pays to talk to your provider and just see if they've got that ability. It's got to be approved by IRD first before they can mm. start doing it. So you talk to your provider, I mean, if you're with... So if you're Telecom. with, yeah, no, no, someone like MYB or um, Cash Manager, um, we know Zero. Oh, that got, sort of yeah, provider. That, yeah, that sort of accounting software provider. <laughs> yeah. um, we know Zero have got that ability. Um, they've got some approvals there um, to do it. Do you guys, as chartered accountants, quietly massage people into finding the right provider for them? Yeah, we. Um, if people come to us and say, look, we're running, looking at running some software, um, what do you recommend? We don't just sort of say, oh, you've got to run this. We actually find out what they're after. You've got to know what they want first because there's so much out there. Um, mm. If you don't give them the right product up front, then you can actually lead them down the wrong path. I mean, to me, it's a very nebulous area because somebody comes to me and they say, um, say I want to buy a computer. And they say, what do you want it to do? And I've got no idea what it's going to do. Yeah, so we'll go through and say, yeah, you want budgets, do you want um, production data, all sorts of sort of things that you know, might be relevant to them. And then yeah. we just narrow it down to one or two and then we make a recommendation and it's really up to them to, to choose which one they want to go with. So you go to somebody who actually knows what the hell they're talking about and yes. saying, this is what you, we suggest, and then once you've done that, come and see us, and we'll show you how it works. Exactly, yeah, because <laughs> you, you don't want to do the off-the-shelf type option anymore. Um, that's where people end up in too much of a mistake, so it's best to talk to your accountant and just say, hey, look, I'm thinking of doing it, what do you recommend? And they'll tell you what they think is best. Because with all due respect, the salesman probably doesn't know as much as a chartered accountant. They won't know anything about it at all. They'll just say it's just a, a accounting software and that's what you want, go okay. for it. My Apparently on my computer, you can go something like, it's got to go zing, and it makes the picture on it look change. I can't work it out, and I don't really need it. But anyway, no. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's change the subject. So basically, we covered all that one. You yep. just talk to your chartered accountant, yep. and you find out what you need to do, yep. and, and then, then, they'll help and then you get do on to it. Yep. That's good. Definitely. There was a lot of kerfuffle about PAYE for businesses rather than provisional tax yes. coming in by 2018. Yep, um, a big announcement on it. Um, there's a little couple of tricks in it though that you've got to watch. Fish hooks? Uh, yeah, the first one is obviously turnover's got to be less than five million. So for a lot of farmers, that's not an issue. Um, but the bigger one is you've actually got to be running accounting software to go onto this pay as you earn type system. Now, if you're still doing it a manual cash book or a spreadsheet or whatever, it's not going to work for you. Um, they've said you've got to be running accounting software. The exact criteria around it, we don't know yet. Um, but I'm guessing with the way they're going, it's going to be a fully computerised type package rather than just a spreadsheet. It should help on cash flow out, shouldn't it? Yeah, well, because as you earn the money, um, that's when you pay your tax. So rather than getting hit three times a year with big lump sum payments you've got to try and save for, um, and especially sometimes when you may not necessarily have the money coming in, uh, it gets pretty tight. This way we'll say if you get 10000 this month, you'll pay a certain percentage of that to IRD as your provisional tax. Okay, so does that... Do you take all the expenses off before you put that in? No, I mean, it's, all, it's all based on the turnover. Uh, okay. So at the moment, there is actually a system out there that you can do it. Um, and based on what they're saying, it's going to operate in the same way. That um, It's going to be based on a bit of a turnover. So they look at your final tax against turnover. Um, because at the moment, I understand, Kerry, that if, you're over, if you earn more than you budgeted for, uh, you can get a UOME. You can do, especially if you're a company. Uh, yes. So if you pay your taxes you're supposed to do during the year, but fine, you make more money, they penalise you for doing well. 
they say that you should have known way back at the start of the year how much you're going to make and paid extra tax as you went. Mm. By going on to this method, they're going to do away with that because you're going to be on top of it. You know exactly what you're making, so that's what you're paid IRD, and you should be pretty much squared up at the end of the year. But your tax deductions aren't, aren't part of that. Well, there's a few little things come through. There should be because they've got to, you can't just ignore them. Um, I mean, they that's, have talked that's part of it, isn't it? Yeah, they have talked about the fact you've still got to make some tax and accounting adjustments as well. Uh, what they are, they haven't put in their press releases or anything like that. So okay. I assume there's going to be you know, calculations like depreciation you've got to factor in. So that's why they're, they're heading down this accounting software route, because it's going to do a lot of the work for you. So all, all this fine print is part of your 40 hours every year that you've got to study and yes, prove. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and <laughs> Which is, is guaranteed, isn't it? You've yeah, got to do that. Yeah, we have to do it. Yeah, there's no choice. 40 um, hours, so you've yeah. got to do it a whole week yep, a just, year. Yeah, yeah. so it, but it's a good idea they've come up with. Um, they just need a bit more refinement, a bit more information about it, and we'll get that as they go. Um, they said they'd like to bring it in earlier, but they want to do the GST and PAYE first, get those systems tidied up, and then they'll move on to this as the next step. So this is all part of the new uh, Of all their transformation system. process and, yeah, computer system that they spend billions on. Yeah. Yeah. And when do we find out? I guess as you find out, we'll find out. Yeah, as, as time goes by and they look at how they're going to do it, um, they put it out in consultation, get ideas from people, that we'll get more and more information released to us. Well, you just keep us in touch, will you? Definitely, you always, yes. <laughs> Kerry, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be talking to the Chamberlains about growing daffodils and tulips. John, you and Hadstock, in fact, have been involved with daffodils and tulips for a long, long time now. Well, I have grown up, I've been here my whole life. My grandfather originally started growing tulips back in the 30s. My father in the 50s introduced daffodils, and I'm still going. Haven't gone anywhere, so <laughs> I'm still learning. You're going to start planting, is that pretty early? Yes, we've had these ones, which you can see here, have been in the cooler since January, so they've had their winter already, and this week they'll be going in the ground, and hopefully early June we'll have some daffodils for everybody in the Christchurch market. Somebody who wants to grow daffodils, for example, there's several ways that you can grow them. Yes, well, either in pots or if you want to naturalise under trees in the garden. Various, yeah, various different ways. It's probably now's the time to start planting. Now, if somebody wants to buy some, where are your bulbs available? Yeah, these are us. We, we mainly sell through the internet. We've got a website. We put them on Trade Me and through our retail shop in Hills Road, in Miss Fever Florist. We sell a lot of bulbs through. It's a pretty big business. There's 10,000 bulbs in every one of these bins. And we, we dig up, to, we have over 100 bins dug each year. And you've still got some in the ground, I assume. I've probably got 30 or 40 acres I haven't dug yet, yes. So, yes, we've got a lot of bulbs. And there's a chiller full as well? The chiller full, yes. We've got uh, about 400,000 in the chiller for early flowers. But, um, so naturalising, you talked about putting them under trees. You don't have to dig... You don't have to dig it all up? If you choose strong varieties, Rob, you leave them in for five, ten years, well, definitely they're fine. They'll keep, they'll keep growing. It, does, it doesn't hurt every so often to just put a spade in and break them up and replant them. But the doubles and the you know, weaker varieties, specialised varieties, I wouldn't naturalise, but good old red cups and trumpets, they'll stay for years. John, you've got a lot of different varieties. How do you keep them all separate? That work has to go in when they're in flower, and everything's carefully recorded and marked and carefully labelled when we dig it. We do have the odd accident, that's where we have mixtures. As far as these are concerned, these will be going into the ground. How, how do, you, do you work the ground up, or what do you do? Uh, we just plough the ground, then rotary hoe it, and then, then I've got a planter just makes a row and they go in the ground. It's all quite simple. Now there's a fly, isn't there, that seems to kill daffodils? No, no, no sissy fly. That's something we hot water treat all our bulbs to prevent that. So that's why we try and dig on a three or four year cycle to make sure everything's treated reasonably regularly. Everything that's dug, we do hot water treat. So if you buy bulbs from us, you know you're getting a good clean, clean bulb. It's a problem that's always going to be there. There's no spray for it. But hot water treating's the only, only solution. We've just got a, it's a proper Dutch bulb digger. It's like a potato digger. We dig them. Dirt and, dirt and all in the rows and then wash the bulbs, the dirt off the bulbs to get a good clean bulb. During the spring you, you sell the flowers? Uh, January we start selling bulbs. 
and in the spring we sell the flowers through our shop and through all the supermarkets and through the Christchurch market in Auckland and Wellington and we do a lot for the Cancer Society which is the end of August which is usually touch and go with the weather but hopefully. You must be very susceptible to weather. Yes, yeah, so we've, this year has been good, we've had early rain so everything started growing and we need it reasonably cool for a while and um, plenty of rain for the next two or three months. And the ideal spring for a bulb grower or a daffodil flower grower? Uh, not No nor'west days. Rain at night's good, not during the day so we can get them picked. And um, no snow. And no hailstorm obviously for the flowers. And once again, you are very vulnerable. Yes, well, a good hailstorm can wipe out a whole crop. The, the only thing we have got now is enough varieties that we're only if we get a storm you only lose one variety and ho hopefully the other ones are further behind or up front so we don't lose everything. Now I understand that you are the third generation but there's a fourth generation coming on. <laughs> when you ring an order bulbs, Courtney's the one that takes all the bulb orders. So she's the one that knows more about it than I do when it comes to the retail side of the bulbs. And you're enjoying it Courtney? Yes I love it. <laughs> so what improvements do you think you'll make that the old man's not doing? get rid of me I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, no he's doing pretty well just making it a bit more organized and yeah. <laughs> One of the lovely things about my job is the wonderful people that I keep meeting and those are two of them. After the break we're going to be talking about how to tell your power company to go away. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy, deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. To feed the world. To protect the future. To live well. To be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Craig, farm security with respect to vehicles and assets is becoming very important. Yeah, very definitely. I think it's like any business when you've got a lot of gear out and about and personnel and those sort of things, you pay to protect them and uh, the only way you can protect them is by locking them away securely and unfortunately farms you can't lock everything away so it's a matter of putting some other safeguards on those vehicles etc or plants so that you can sort of track them or keep an eye on them um, to stop people from stealing them or if they do steal them making that recovery process that much easier. Because farmers are notorious for not turning a key because they've got to turn it again in the morning. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, I mean, it, it comes down to um, making sure that you're, you're being aware of the fact that, uh, that uh, people are starting to remove equipment, whether you leave it lying around or whether you, even if you lock it away, a padlock's only going to keep an honest person out. Uh, some of these guys, if they're that hell-bent and flogging stuff, they'll flog it anyway. It's a matter of trying to track it and, and make sure that it's retrievable. 
So what are the options? What's available? Well, fairly basic. You can, um, you, can, you can go for a unit like this particular little one here, which is a spot tracker. Um, they're about a uh, price point of, of about uh, 220 plus GST uh, and about um, $150 per year to actually run that unit. Uh, and the beauty of that is it can hide away in any particular position on the vehicle itself. It can either be run by four, four uh, AAA batteries inside it. Uh, and if that has a movement alert, so if somebody hops into the vehicle and moves that, um, you will get a ping through to the uh, PC and you can even set it up onto your mobile phone if you're in coverage, etc., to track that. So if that was stolen off site, retrospectively you could go into the system and you could see where that particular um, vehicle is because of the update that's coming off this unit, which as you can see by the size of it is relatively easy to, to hide on a vehicle, even a quad bike. So we're talking four wheel motorbikes, utes, tractors, cars. If you had a genera portable generator on site, etc., you could stick one of those on the portable generator and that would then give you this, the information as well. And you can list them as to the type of product that it is. You can actually name them what you want to call them, etc., uh, and it will give you an update on movement. So, so somebody turns up to your property with a van and loads your four-wheel motorbike into the back of it, you can actually um, know where it's gone and the police can turn up and go hello 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 yes exactly exactly and it's also it requires to, to be able to see the sky so whilst it's in the van itself chances are it uh, it won't be being pinged but as soon as they unload it uh, and it's uh, out in the open etc it will show where that unit is gps is vital well gps is not just about policing you know policing staff members and those sort of things we've gone which way which we've gone way past that now because this is this is more of an asset tracker and then when you can move into farms, like any other business, trucking firms and those sort of things, because you've got requirements for occupational safety and health, plus also knowing as a manager of the farm, you're responsible for each and every person that's on that farm and knowing that they're back and they're safe or where they are on the farm, or if they have an accident um, and they call up, hopefully on an RT, uh, you'll be in a situation where you'll know where, that, where they are so you can converge on that spot uh, to make sure that you get there uh, to a system as quickly as possible. That brings us into the subject of two-way radios or walkie-talkies as we used to call them. Well, I mean, obviously at Teo Park Limited, that's, our fun, that's a um, pivotal part of our business. It's the hub of what we do. I've been working here for 23 years and that's all I've done the whole time I've been here effectively is two-way radio. Um, Motorola, as far as our main uh, supplier of product, etc., we're at the, definitely at the quality end of the, of the um, spectrum. But as far as the uh, radios are concerned, they're able to, depending on the network that you're on, they're able to give GPS, they're able to give um, information, uh, let alone the communications that it provides on the farm for efficiency, etc. So, you know, there's a lot of pluses in that area. So there's still research and development going on? Oh, very definitely. Now that we've gone into the digital phase of, of uh, radio, we're now able to get into IP so that they can connect into computer systems. We can talk from Canterbury to another country if we want to. Um, through a two-way radio? Through a two-way radio, through the network, because as soon as they're on IP, of course, you get into the internet, and we can feed the audio in at this end, and it comes out at the other end, whether it be across onto a computer or across onto another radio. So, yes. Now, I'm well over 19. Is it too hard for somebody who's carrying a gold card to actually understand all this? Well, the complex, complexity of the, of the systems and the networks that the operator are on is, is where we come in. You know, we, we take the pain out of the connectivity and for the end users concerned, as far as, they can, as far as their operations concerned, they press the button and they talk. And that information can go wherever they wish it to go. Um, I think uh, if you've got a, a cell phone, a smartphone or something like that, where there are applications where you can dial in, you could be sitting on the beach in Fiji and still check or call into the farm if you wanted to, using the Wi-Fi across the internet and back into the radio system if that's the way that it's set up. So this being isolated to just coverage of, of 10Ks from the farm, etc., on, uh, on a set repeater is now long gone. You can have a manager in Christchurch and still talk to a farm in Ashburton if that's the case. So it's a case of not knowing, or not needing to know how it works, just knowing that it does work. Exactly, and I think that's what I think that's what we've got to get our head around. Is the fact that investing in the technology is not necessarily knowing how it works, uh, other than a very broad brushstroke. It's a matter of actually having the the um, ability to understand that when you press the button, it's going to come out the other end, whether that be on the farm or whether that be within the coverage that you require, which could be Ashburton to Christchurch or North Canterbury, whatever you want, or international, or international if that's what you want. 
It is rather sad, isn't it, that you have to go to those sorts of lengths to look after what is yours and not, nothing to do with anybody else, but that's, I'm afraid, life in 2016. In just a moment or two, we're going to be talking about a much brighter note. It's going to be juices. Homegrown juice, it's, um, it's just come onto the market. Yes, it is. Uh, homegrown has started um, just short of two years ago, and um, it is uh, basically sourced around local product. So all, all the fruit is, low, uh, is sourced locally. We have our um, own orchards in Hastings, 120 hectares of oranges, and they've planted a, a heck of a lot more to, to try to keep up with the demand. Now, interestingly, you say cold pasteurised. How does that work? Well, historically, most products um, in the juice department are hot pasteurised, which means they heat the product up um, and then bring it down in temperature very quickly. And that, what that does is kill the bugs. Um, but it also, in doing that, it, it also kills a lot of the taste and also kills the vitamin, a bit of the vitamin C in the product. So what we're doing is a cold yeah, pasteurised method, which um, puts the product, we, we, we squeeze the product, put it straight into the bottle, and then put it through a cold pasteurising machine which has been imported from America. And what that does is bring the temperature down under pressure um, to below zero degrees, and then that does the same thing. It kills the bugs, um, which gives it the 30-day life, uh, and then it's sealed. But what it doesn't do is kill the taste, so that the taste is as if you were eating into the product fresh off the tree. And also there's, there's no need for putting preservatives or, or any additives whatsoever, so it's a completely natural product. So, okay, it's sort of as though you just squeezed it at Absolutely home. Absolutely, as though as squeezed it at home, yeah. I think, Mike, we're getting more and more aware of preservatives and what preservatives are in things. Um, more and more people are concerned with what they're putting into their bodies. And um, this product fits into the category really, really well because it's totally natural. Um, and that is a big point of difference um, to other products in the market. The other thing is a lot of people I talk to are saying that they are losing weight because they've dropped added sugar and, and sugar in their diets. Well, of course, all, all fruit has um, a, point, a, a degree of sugar in it, and um, with our product it has, has got no added sugar whatsoever, but it has got its own uh, natural uh, glucose sugar in it, which is um, you know, the same as when you were biting into an apple or an orange. Um, but there's nothing added to it, so it's very healthy. You, you've already got 120 hectares planted, but I guess there's more to so you can catch up. Yes, correct. We're, we're, we've, um, the, the demand is just keeps growing every year, so we've, we've put uh, uh, three times as many uh, trees than we had last year just to keep up with the demand. Um, and so the, the new orchard will be on stream uh, at the end of the year. A fair bit of machinery, is it pretty mechanised? No, it's, it's automated, um, but they, they are um, squeezed and then bottled and then through the cold pasteurising machine they have to be hand, um, hand packed and processed through the, uh, through the cold pasteurising machine and then packed at the other end. So it's a good um, source of uh, employment up in the Hastings areas which they desperately need as well. What's the feedback been like? Uh, it's been fantastic. We've, we've um, obviously all the supermarkets have the, have it on their shelf, and it's a distinctively uh, white bottle, um, which uh, you know it actually protects the um, the goodness of the of the product. So the the the, uh, the rays, um, ultraviolet. Uh, the ultraviolet rays, are protected by having a white bottle. But on, it also is a very good marketing ploy because it stands out on the shelf, um, and so we've had lots of uh, tastings in the supermarkets. And the, repl uh, the, you know, the, the feedback we're getting is incredible. The people absolutely love it. Um, and it's an, it's an easy sell, really, because once they've tasted it, they just keep coming back. And it certainly lives up to its name. We're now going to be talking later in the program about mental health and catching up, looking after ourselves. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website 
ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet. To feed the world. To protect the future. To live well. To be the generation that will make a change. Join us. There's been a lot of kerfuffle of late about producing 90% of renewable power or getting power from a renewable source. I thought it was a very opportune time for us to revisit the gentleman who runs GeoSun and because of his system you can tell your provider for your electricity to go away. Brian, who or what is GeoSun? Uh, GeoSun was a, is a company founded by a group of four of us uh, when um, we stumbled across the idea of multiple source energy recovery on farms. So after a period of research uh, we established the company and um, hit the market in the later part of last year. So there's three different forms of energy? Yes, we, we start with the principle that there is enough energy on any particular farm in this country on any particular day to satisfy the energy requirements of that property. Unfortunately, it's not always in the form that you would like. So by using three different forms of energy recovery, we're able to uh, provide it in a format that the farmer can use. The farmer just pushes the button or turns the handle or opens the valve. He doesn't have to worry about where the energy is coming from. What our system does is, is capture the energy and put it in a format that he needs to use. So what are the three? Well, we all start with the sun. The sun is the vital ingredient in a property like this uh, to grow the grass and it's the, it's the greatest uh, um, energy source we have on the planet. So solar energy is obviously an important one. And from that you can see what I mean by each form having its advantages or disadvantages. Obviously solar energy is not so good uh, during the night and, and on cloudy days like this. From there we go to a geothermal energy exchange and again we think of the sun as a source of that. Uh, a lot of the sun's energy doesn't go into grass, it doesn't do anything else, it just heats the surface of the planet. And that energy is stored there for us by the planet. So by um, finding a way to exchange that energy, to bring it to the surface, then that's another form we can use for heating or cooling. Uh, and the third type, again started with the sun, because the sun was necessary to grow the grass. The cow ate that grass, turned some of it into milk and some of it into waste. And that waste still has energy in it. And from that, um, through the anaerobic digester process, we can turn that waste into biogas. Uh, now biogas um, is an interesting material and you can use it for generating electricity or heat, but it's very good to store, very easy to store. So there's another reason why you would have three types. They all have their advantages and when you put them together, you get a self-sufficient energy system on a farm. So you're tying all three into one? Yeah, that's really the, the key to it, Rob. Uh, all the technologies I've just mentioned are not new. They have been around the world in various forms for many, many years. And in the case of biodigesters, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, what is new is the ability to bring them all into one network. So the farmer doesn't have to think when he turns on the irrigation pump where that particular electricity is coming from. All he needs to know is that it's working. Uh, so um, that idea of a common network that the energy can be put into is the, is the real crux of what we've achieved. 
Now looking at this farm, you've got several irrigators, you've got probably several homes, and you've also got a dairy shed. Are you suggesting that you can come off the grid? That would be the ultimate goal, um, and certainly on a property like this, there's 720 odd cows being milked here. Um, so we could very definitely go off grid here by a combination of all three of the energy types I spoke of. Now, I want to know more about this hole in the ground business because to most people that's real smoke and mirror stuff. Yes, a lot of people in New Zealand hear the word geothermal and they think of Taupo and Rotorua and those sort of places and they're right, that is geothermal energy. Um, however, there are other forms of geothermal energy, what we refer to as low temperature geothermal. And that is simply um, the energy which is stored in the surface of the earth itself. When you go down um, a few metres, you'll find that it's, things start to, to heat up. In fact, they stay at a temperature far higher than the ambient temperature. By the time you're down 15 metres, that temperature is stable. It doesn't move much between summer and winter, night or day, wet season, dry season. So if you can harness that energy, and bring that to the surface where you can then connect it to say um, a refrigeration plant to, to use to cool the milk on a farm or to the hot water cylinders used for washing the, uh, the dairy down at the end of milking then that energy, of course the sun gave it to you, you've got it for free there are no moving parts required to get it to the surface all we're doing is using the um, law of fluid, one of the laws of fluid dynamics, which is the law of equilibrium, where if you put two substances together, their heat or their, their temperature will match over time. So if you've got a nice warm constant temperature under your feet and we put some cold water down there, that water will come to the surface having absorbed the energy from the, from the earth. Likewise, we take some hot water from the surface because it's just gone through and taken that heat from the milk and put it down the hole then it discharges that heat into the earth. And so by that simple process, we can use it to heat um, the hot water and chill the milk. Brian, it's been trialled and proved in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, it's a pretty common practice. Low temperature geothermal uh, in Europe, Canada and the United States is, a, is a, an everyday way of heating. If you look at Germany, for instance, they've got 300,000 geothermal closed loop systems uh, operating throughout the country and an awful number of those for domestic heating. Um, here in Christchurch uh, eight of the new buildings going up for the rebuild um, have geothermal heating and cooling. Christchurch International Airport has used geothermal energy for heating and cooling for the last decade. Um, so it's not, um, it's not new technology as I said before, it's just a new way of applying it and this idea of bringing it all onto one network. So I guess if you do use all three, you can totally cut your electricity bills. They'll be gone. Yes, it's about lowering that cost, lowering that cost of production. If you're not paying the power bill, you're using what you've already got, which you got for free, um, your, your cost of production goes down. John, you've got a four point philosophy. Yes, yes, so it was with some trepidation that Rob agreed to let me discuss the philosophy of health as, as outlined by Martin Heidegger. Probably, I think, the greatest philosopher of the last century, right? But he wrote this rather turgid piece called Building, Dwelling, Thinking. And he talks about the whole idea that, I mean, we've all seen buildings where they're a monolithic slab of concrete and go, hmm, wouldn't want to live in that. And then we well, have to hang your pictures up for a start. Well, exactly. <laughs> Which is essential, you see, you're getting to the point of it, because he says there are four elements to what he calls dwelling. And these should be in our dwellings, right? And they should be in the way in which we dwell, because dwell is both, a dwelling can be both a verb and the place in which we live, a noun, right? But he said four elements. And he has this little phrase, we live on the earth, beneath the skies, in the presence of mortals and before the divinities. Now, if you just take those four things together, right, and you, and you um, see and cut them down and analyse them. We live on the earth, which means there are basic elements that we need to survive. We need four walls, a roof, water, food, shelter, right? Yep. The essential cave, right? But the cave's not the cave, right, if these other elements aren't there. So on the earth, beneath the skies. Now, far too many of us let lights determine our day, 
right? Yeah. And the day can be very long because it of can lights. be very long because lights can extend it. Mm. And and then all those shift workers who just simply work at the wrong time of the day. Um, and and also if you think of about um, you know under if we're living under the skies, right? It's not just the time; it's also the seasons. So we are biologically designed to eat the foods that we evolved with, and different foods are there for different seasons, but our needs are different in those seasons as well. So we shouldn't be importing salad stuff in the middle of winter? No, we should be eating our brassicas. You know, we should be eating our winter vegetables. Uh, and they, they tend to be more sort of fat-developing, body-developing vegetables, you know, root vegetables and but potatoes. That's because it's cold. That's, and we need, we, need, we need heat. Yeah, so we live on the earth, right, Beneath the, uh, beneath the skies, so yep. beneath the seasons, right? In the presence of mortals. Our cave is not a cave without a cave partner, right? We need to have people around us. We need to have the tribe. Yeah, we because we are tribal. We yep. are fundamentally tribal. Mm -hmm. So good health, good existential health, mental health, right? Comes from dealing with all those elements. And before the divinities, now Heidegger was not a religious man, right? But he recognised spirituality within us. We are all fundamentally a spiritual creature. We are possibly the only fundamentally spiritual creature. And you can never be at peace with all the others if you are not at peace with your own inner self, your conscience, your belief system, right? So there it is, it's simple. On the earth, beneath the skies, in the presence of mortals and before the divinities, you hook all four of those and you have what he called dwelling. You are dwelling on the earth the way you should be. And he said it's only then you should engage in thinking. I'm interested about the self-belief thing because, you know, there's, as you know, especially you uh, and what people you're treating, is this depression and all that sort of thing. And a number of times that people have said to me, look in the mirror and see if you love yourself. And of course, we don't love ourselves because we're, we're tall poppies get cut off. <laughs> hey, hey, and there's another thing in that. Don't just look in the mirror. Look into your eyes in the mirror because they're the window to the soul, you know. And there's this fantastic poem uh, called um, The Guy in the Glass. So all you people out there watching this uh, on the web, right, open another window and flick up The Guy in the Glass, right? And it's sort of the last line of it goes something like, um, if you pass through life and get pats on the back and smiles as you pass, right, go and ask The Guy in the Glass. And if you cheated him, right, it'll all amount to that. Because we, we as a race, especially the farming people, are not pro-loving themselves? No, no, and they tend to be overly critical of themselves, and when things go wrong, it's my fault, and sometimes things are just wrong, you know? Sometimes, but also, you know, perhaps step one back and go, okay, where's the lesson in this? Uh, a, a chiropractic philosopher who, John Demartini, who I sort of don't really like a lot of the stuff, but he wrote one piece I did like, <laughs> and that was on gratitude. Yeah. He said, no matter how bad something is, right, there is something to be taken from it. Be grateful for the lesson if you can't be grateful for anything else. Right now, a lot of dairy farmers go, oh, yeah, bloody great, that is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where's yeah. the lesson here? Do you want to borrow my gum boots and walk in them for a couple of miles? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, we go, well, no, no, D. Martini should. I thought it was a bit fluffy at the time, but no, I, I, but I do think, you know, there's always something to be learned. There's always yeah. something there. Why is it, John, that when things are bad and you're, taking, you're starting to take hidings that you get so many of them? And when things are going well, you don't seem to get any hidings. Well, remember, good and bad are in the end of fundamentally perceptions. So when things are bad, right, when we are at greater risk, when the cave's under threat, the tribe's under threat, our very being is under threat, we become far more threat averse and therefore far more threat focused. So we look out for things more. And so we tend to also run the risk of catastrophizing. That is, we are constantly thinking about what can go wrong. Uh, and they usually do. And there's something comes down the tubes and boof. Well, no, they don't, yeah. Some, maybe thoughts are formative in the process of thinking something, you actually make it happen. But, but I think too, um, it's, you know, remember the glass is always full, right? Yep. Even if it's only got half water, there's air in the rest. So it's always full. <laughs> It's a question of perspective. John, thank you very much indeed. And if you'd like to recap or go back over John's conversations, which are always crackers, as you know, you can catch him on our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme, but they will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.